Welcome back to the show, everybody. Check out these headlines. Hugo Filion from Flair Network speak out about the betrayal. Flair market manipulation or necessary operations, you decide. We're going to look at some really, really incredible breaking information. SEC versus uh, Ripple settlement chances still very much alive, says one legal analyst, and you're going to want to know about it. And how about the difference between fair market value and market value? Guess what? We talked about it over the weekend, but I am going to show you today what you don't know. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow us on TikTok, YouTube, and Twitter for exclusive content. Right now, $1.08 trillion market cap for cryptocurrency. It's up 0.1%. Careful what you call progress this morning. Bitcoin, 22,700 plus. Ethereum, 1,600 slightly over. Tether market cap, 66.7 billion, they say. XRP is 42 cents. We're up 10.2% on the seven day, ladies and gentlemen. Let's take a look at this. Ledger Stacks has have you done it? Have you done your pre-order by hitting the button? The first thing you need to do to get the best price is click the link underneath this video because you also know that it's a trusted vetted link. That's very important. This is the creator of the iPod. This thing is finally looking user friendly so somebody like me doesn't have to call my oldest brother and get him to walk me through how this works. I mean, I love Ledger. I love what they do. I love the security. I've had absolutely zero issue, but it's difficult for somebody who's not tech savvy like me. And this is looking like the solution. Click that link underneath the video, ladies and gentlemen. Take a look at this. Ethereum working great. Only $39,050 in gas fees for a transaction. Not exactly what we call a solution for the future, now is it? <laughs> Tim. Gary Gensler resigns, says here, pay double to get half. Solid investment. There you go. Oh, Tim. Oh, boy. That's a good Yeah. Careful. Know what you hold, ladies and gentlemen. Now, look, we're going to take a look at two sides of this coin here. Flair founder speaks out about betrayal, and this is to XRP holders. Hugo Filion begin, uh, begins by acknowledging how this proposal may make some people feel betrayed by Flair. He then seeks to explain that their intention is not to ignore these feelings, but instead address the prior model's issues to facilitate a smoother redistribution of tokens from those who don't want them long-term to those who do. Villian also shares that its design is inspired by Bitcoin and intends to reward those who build infrastructure with more tokens than initially expected. The CEO of Flare then emphasizes that XRP holders exclusively received Flare for simply holding it, and Flair has been the only major VC-backed project building on the XRP ecosystem. I appreciate Hugo's comments there. Oz Crypto, however, brings something else to light here. And this is, again, you have to weigh this out for yourself. This is information I was not aware of. I'm sure there are a lot of people out here not aware of it. He says... Here is a list of FTSOs, Flare Time Series Oracles, whose wallets transferred their Flare to BitTrue and sold before it was available to the public. More to be confirmed in the coming day or so. And then he lists the wallets here that he believes have done exactly that. Now, what's interesting about this is that this has been validated at least by one Flare Time Series Oracle, Oracle, Light FTSO, and I appreciate their honesty and full disclosure. And they say in the interest of those two things, Light FTSO received 280,000 Flare grant on January 8th and sold a portion of it, 110,000 Flare, before the wider community received their tokens this was enabled by BitTrue, allowing Flare deposits. He says, we're 100%, uh, we 100% understand 
that it wasn't right and offer an, any unreserved, I'm sorry, and offer an unreserved apology for it. And just to be completely clear about this, our sales were made at an average price of 24 cents. We didn't sell at the top, he says. They damn sure sold at a price you and I couldn't have. We didn't dump the price. Our sales were spaced out and using limit orders as much as possible in order to minimize the impact on the price. These sales were made in order to ensure the continuous operation of our services for at least a year. So there is the explanation of why that had to be done. And we got to show both sides here. Light FTO says, we believe in the future of Flair and Songbird and we want to be a part of it. And that's why we sold. We can't operate if we have no funds for it. There's an FTSO committee in the making and we'll have to talk about this when that time comes. And it goes on and on. But you get the point. Now, I appreciate the full disclosure there from Light FTSO. Oz Crypto came back here late last evening and says, Willingly taking flair and selling it onto an unfounded market is not just collusion, he says. It's market manipulation and obtaining advantage through deceit. I gave more than 24 hours after getting Hugo to admit this was known. One FTSO has come forward. I'll give the others one more hour. Look, I, look, this is new, right? And again, I just want everybody to have all the information. I didn't have it. I'm not making a decision one way or the other. I'm showing both sides of the coin. Oz Crypto has issue with about how the, the fact that the FTSO wallets actually sold into the face of the public basically or before and were able to achieve a much better sale price for themselves, Right before we all ended up getting it. And now it's what, two, three cents, something of that nature. Uh, you know, is it growing pains? Is it what Oz Crypto suggested here? Market manipulation? I don't know. Is it just necessary operational cost? You know, all of this really needs to be answered. And I hope that we get to hear from Hugo Filion. Uh, he can clear this up better than anybody. Speaking of clearing things up here, let's talk about this. Because this gentleman that's talking in this video is the Executive Director of Compliance Regulation Program at the University of Hong Kong. And he gives his prediction on the SEC versus Ripple case. And he, like Bill Morgan, agrees that settlement is still very much alive in the SEC versus Ripple case. Let's take a listen to this. Talking, of course, about the SEC versus Ripple case. And this case, which is the second loudest after the Telegram one, really showed everyone the need of actual regulatory clarity. And until it's reached cases of any range, smaller ones or bigger ones, like the one with Telegram or XRP here, can altogether be a true security case or a business battle case or a politically flavored case. What do you think of the Ripple case? Where does it put the SEC and where it can direct the blockchain community. Who would like to kick off here? I I, I, I will kick off. Um, sure. I think that it's a most unfortunate case and it's hard to really get into the mindset of the SEC to bring the action. There's a lot of commentary floating around about uh, uh, that that's positioning the case against uh, the comments that uh, William Hinman made back in 2018 uh, about Ethereum being sufficiently decentralized uh, that it's not of interest to the SEC. The SEC now seems to be saying that, oh, look, because there is a company, Ripple, that seems to make a difference. When, if you look at it from a functional point of view, the fact is that Ethereum, the developers of Ethereum at the Ethereum Foundation are effectively still evolving uh, Ethereum in a similar way. Bingo. My expectation is that this is simply creating uncertainty, that it is highlighting the, uh, the, 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 the failure of the SEC actually to do better in terms of clarity to an industry that is already huge and becoming larger. Uh, and I, my, my prediction on an outcome is that uh, if we get enough exchanges between the lawyers 
this will provide interesting insights, but that we won't get to a court judgment on it. I think we'll get to a point where there's a face-saving settlement from both sides, pretty much like Telegram, pretty much like uh, EOS before it, uh, and that's where we will be left, which unfortunately is, is kind of like two steps forward and three steps backwards. I tell you, you know, that is something else right there. And then there's more here from Bill Morgan. Shout out to Bill. Really appreciate his legal analysis and sharing information as so many others have. And it's just remarkable to have access to them. Ripple don't need the SEC to say that XRP is not a security. Keep listening now. If you listen carefully to what Brad says, it is that Ripple needs the SEC to agree that today's XRP is not a security, as it did with Ethereum in the Hinman speech. Room for settlement, says Bill Morgan. Fair playing field, finally. And it is exactly what Brad Garlinghouse has said. And if you come down here, it really brings it home because this taps into what we've heard John Deaton say to us at times and Jeremy Hogan as well. Shout out to those gentlemen. When the lawsuit commenced, as the controversy in the lawsuit is for offers and sales of 2020, a logical point could be when Ripple ceased programmatic sales of XRP in mid-2019. We've covered that heavily here, ladies and gentlemen. Sales since then have been for on-demand liquidity partners, which is not an investment by ODL partners, but consumptive use. Well said, Bill Morgan. This comes into the idea that whether there's either a settlement or a ruling where the judge could separate certain sections of this case and that's where you could find yourself saying well since the creation of RippleNet and on-demand liquidity it is no longer an XR uh, a no longer security issue from there going forward but this previous sales from the early days could fall under that and that's how the SEC gets a big fine we have heard this before now whether this comes in the form of a settlement or a ruling is what we still don't know, right? So very much on that. Now, listen, I was going to do this fair market value versus market value and show you what you don't know, but this video is already getting a little long and I need a few minutes for that. So I'm going to put that in the next video. Do not miss it. I'm going to show you what you don't know about fair market value of XRP. Period. Full stop. I'll catch all of you on the next one. Not financial advice from me or anyone else. I'll talk to you soon.